to uh, welcome you to our Saturday session of Writing More Than Your Book with Dale Phillips. But before we give the talk, I'd like to thank the Thayer Library for their generous support in um, providing venues and services for writers like us. I'd also like to thank the Sterling Lancaster Community TV, SLCT, who is uh, filming today's session for broadcast later on the local cable TV stations. Now, a few announcements about Seven Bridge. Um, next month, we'll have John Bell. On the 17th of November, we'll have John Bell. John Bell is from Newton, Massachusetts, and he'll be here talking about choices in narrative voices. So this will be a Saturday session, free and open to the public. And John is an historian who uh, specializes in the early years of the American Revolution. So I think that puts him in a unique position to discuss first person, second person, third person, past us, first tense, and so forth, the logistics of putting you, the reader, in a completely different time, and perhaps uh, revealing something about a completely different historical person. So I think his talk on narrative voices will be a very compelling and interesting one. So look for that on November 17th. In January, on the 19th, our very own Paula Kastner, who is the uh, Chief Operating Officer for the Seven Bridge Writers Collaborative, will be talking in a Saturday session uh, on writing effective transitions. Now this is an issue that typically plagues a lot of writers, and this is going from different point of views, different time frames, different locations, and so on, so <coughs> smoothly in your writing. So Paula is going to break it down <clears throat> and give us insights into this. Now, because transitions can be tricky to master, and I see some folks nod nodding in the, in the background there, so that's very reassuring. Because it's a, trifty, cri uh, it's a tricky craft technique, um, we're going to offer an intensive on writing transitions the following week. So on January 26th, there will be a session two on writing transitions. Now, this second session uh, will require pre-registration, and there is a $40 fee. However, I think that if you are writing a piece right now and you have some questions or concerns about your transitions, that that intensive is the place for you. So it will be a two and a half hour session. Come with your samples and Paula will help you understand the whole gestalt of transitions. Our next open mic is here at the library on Tuesday the 23rd. Come for your five minutes at the mic, your five minutes uh, with a audience who is listening just to you. Read your poem, recite your essay, talk about a piece of prose you're doing. But um, it starts at 6.30, it's our first of the, of the session, and it always is a good time. Now finally, here at Seven Bridge, we constantly strive to improve the programming that we off offer you, our writers. <clears throat> And we're trying to improve the quality and variety of our sessions. We're trying to get new speakers in and so forth. And our ability to do this largely depends on you. We want to thank, we appreciate the support we've gotten from those of you who have given. But if you feel benefited by Dale's talk today, perhaps you'll express your appreciation with a few dollars in our dreaded black for them, not me. You can buy books, though, and that, that's for me. <laughs> Just wanted to get that in there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but if you'd like to express your gratitude, a few hours in the, in the city would be greatly appreciated. Now, for those of you who are listening to a recording of this session, you can express your appreciation by going to the Seven Bridge website, sevenbridge.org, S-E-V-E-N, bridge.org and click on the contribute to SW, SWBC and you can make a donation in the form of a credit card or PayPal. Now Dale Phillips is our featured speaker today. Dale has a long career in technical writing, in fiction writing, in non-fiction writing. He studied under Stephen King at the University of Maine. He's well known in New England writing circles as a professional speaker. He does sessions such as this.
frequently in various library venues and other places. He speaks at writers' conferences, gives seminars, and as I said, he's a prolific writer, and he's a very agile writer. So he has a Zach Taylor mystery series on the table, and he also has a compelling horror story called The Shadows of the Wendigo, which is my favorite novel. <laughs> and it might be a nice gift for somebody if you're thinking toward Halloween. But Dale is a muse to many. He has a vivid imagination. He's a talented writer, and I'm pleased to call him my friend. Aww. So today he's talking about the business side of writing. So I think this is an aspect of writing that many of us would like to ignore, because it's not necessarily creating a different world or a different um, experience for our readers. It's telling our readers who we are and telling them what we've done. So Dale is going to navigate that broad terrain for us and get into some of the many topics such as a writer's biography, um, maybe even a, a, the synopsis, which is, tends to be very tricky for all of us. But Dale is going to guide us through those elements and provide some insights that we can take home and use. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dale Phillips. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula, and thank you everyone for coming out on a gloomy Saturday <laughs> in the fall. Uh, thank you also to the library, Hollis. Uh, we much appreciate uh, being able to host these sections in a comfortable environment. Uh, thank you to Seven Bridge Collaborative, which uh, is providing just tremendous support for writers in this area. And please support their programs and give them feedback and tell them what you'd like to see and uh, the kind of programs you'd like to engage in. And be, be an active member of that because uh, they do rely on your support and they're trying to do great work. And thank you to the community television, which is uh, filming this and also supporting. So see, the, the great part about writing is the supportive community that you become engaged in. Uh, I am constantly amazed when I go to uh, large conferences and there's professional writers who most of do not act in competition with each other, but in, in solidarity and cooperation and support. And uh, the generosity is just stunning sometimes, you know, when you've got a New York Times bestseller who's talking to you as an equal. And you're like, well, that's pretty good. And they're giving you advice and information uh, all for free. Or sometimes you can buy them a drink at the bar if you need to, whatever. But um, the great thing is, is that be that kind of writer who supports others. Be that kind of writer who's always helping everyone else to do better as well. And what Ursula said is, yes, the, um, getting the original content is one part. Getting a book done or whatever, whatever project you're working on to get that out. But that's the craft side. And Seven Bridge does a terrific job of helping you improve your craft. But there's also the business side, which is never, ever taught. In MFA programs and all writing uh, fellowships, things like that, they do not teach the business side of writing, which can be equally important for many writers. If you want to do something more than a hobby, if you want to write for just more than a few friends, things like that, if you want to put this information out, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, or whatever, for a paying audience, they're going to expect things. There is a, um, a minimum standard on what people want to see. There is a, there is a baseline. Uh, we can get into all that, but I mean, if you're a carpenter, you have to know more than just how to hammer a nail or saw a board. Uh, if you're going to build a house and the walls don't meet and the roof leaks and the floors sag and things are uneven, nobody's going to want to buy that. So the same way that a carpenter must have a variety of tools and knowledge and how to use them, the writer needs to know all these tools and knowledge and includes the structure and syntax of the language, the proper spelling, punctuation, and the dreaded grammar. That's the craft side of it. But the business side is being the best craftsman you can and also knowing how to sell and market and distribute and communicate with everyone else. Um, Here's just a short list of the types of communication you might be called upon to uh, create. And I can tell you I've done a great many of these things, a lot of them very successfully. But um, you never know. When you are a writer, people will ask you for all kinds of things. There's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's poetry, articles, query letters. We're going to get into a lot of that today to agents, editors, publishers. If you submit a story, you have to write a cover letter, which goes along with your story. And uh, the query letter is as many people will tell you, is one of the hardest things to create because it has to be on such a professional level 
to sell the work that you've done and you've got to do in 300 words what it took you maybe three years or more to write. <laughs> and you have to convince them in a few seconds that you're the person that they want to talk to. There's also acceptance letters. Hey, surprise, somebody said yes to you. So now you have to work out all the, uh, the arrangements and the agreements. You have to talk about the future. You have to talk about what's going on then. Then you've got contract negotiations. So there's a lot of communication there. You've got synopses, as Ursula said. You've got book synopses, which is another stumbling point for many, many creators. You might have uh, grant applications. Uh, recently, uh, a couple months ago, I did one. I uh, sent one off to Killer Nashville because they have uh, grants for people to come and attend the conference, and there was no way I could afford all the costs related to that. But they had a contest of, you know, tell us why you want to come in X no number of words. And I did that, didn't think anything of it. Next thing I know, I'm on my way to Nashville. So there can be a lot at stake here. Uh, you could have uh, scholarship applications, job applications, uh, fellowship applications. If you're a writer, there's many opportunities uh, to go to places uh, for uh, colonies that will uh, pay you to just come and, and write your works for a few months and support you for a while. All kinds of opportunities. Uh, yes, please do write down anything you see. Uh, also, write down any questions you have. We will give you plenty of time for that. And also, I would uh, ask you later on to sign up uh, because I will send you this information and I will send you a very large list of resources which will point you in all the right directions. So that's your first test in clear communications. Can you write down an email that I can read <laughs> and access? So yes, you're all on the hook for that. But it will be great information and it's free and no obligation and you're not going to get spammed. So don't worry about that. But there's more than just what we can do in this two hours. There's so much more. As you, as you can see from this list, it just goes on and on. And there are entire courses and semesters in college dedicated to one aspect of all this, just to sharpening that. So we'll go on with that. So contest essays. You might have to write one for, for money or for a chance to uh, win some wonderful prize. And uh, all the writing contests that they have, you could, you could look at Writer's Digest and uh, just find hundreds of these. There are proposals. There's website and blog content. Yes, welcome to the modern age, where you might be called upon to write all kinds of things in support of your, your book or books or other projects. Interviews. You might be called upon to write up your own interviews and give everybody a precy of your life for the last uh, X number of years in 800 words. There's also wills. Wills are a very good business communication because what you're trying to do is support the future by making things very, very clear as to your wishes, exactly what you want to do, which will hold up in a court of law. You don't think about that, but that's a business communication. There's also marketing content. As a writer, you will be uh, required by many to write up all kinds of things in support of your business. Uh, there are reviews. There are recommendations for other writers. There are formal complaint letters. You might be doing some of those in the future. There's course and training material. I had to create this and this this year and last year I've been doing a lot of course and training material, creating from the many, many different sources, collating that together and coming up with something useful. There's uh, instructions. There's any other kinds of writing. That's just a short list. <laughs> so don't get scared. This is all learnable. This is all learnable. So my question to a lot of you, if you're willing to uh, put this forth, since Sevenbridge wants to know what you look for, so what is everyone looking for in, in these two hours? What's the kind of thing you're particularly most interested in? Yes? Synopsis. Query Synopsis, letters, OK. Query letters and contract negotiations. OK, so good. The fiction side of it. OK, there's a start. <laughs> Let's just work on that. Anybody have anything else completely different? You know, a media kit, a basic media ah, kit. Ah, yes, a press kit, yeah, or a media press. kit. Yep, yeah, exactly. Wow, OK, good. Okay. Proposal for a porch. Okay, good. As you can see, there's so much. Hey, come on in. Sign up sheet right there. Grab your seat. <coughs> We're obviously not going to get to do anything, but what I'm going to do is give you a great framework and give you some places to go for information and the resource list. You'll be able to access many other places. This is just the starting point. This is part of education. It's not a, a one-off and I get to know everything after one class. This is a way to orient you so that you can ease into this world, know where to find this information, and get the help you need. 
Okay, so we've, we've gone through that. The best thing about writing is you don't need any, any license or any, grab a seat, yeah, any advanced degree, any special equipment other than a method of putting words on paper. Either you can do that uh, like we do here or you can do it on a screen any number of ways. Uh, but communicating through writing can be more than what people are putting into their IMs, their tweets, their Facebook posts, a lot more. Um, with writing communications, many of the times you're asking a stranger for a favor. You're asking for their time, first of all, to read what you have written in your communication, and you're asking usually uh, for their consideration on something. Are they trying to grant you something? Uh, a book contract, uh, an acceptance of a story, uh, the contest essay uh, for, for the judges, anything like that. Uh, so there is a great deal at stake in all these. And you have to be a number of different things in your communication to make sure that you're doing the best you can. The first thing is targeted. Is this communication targeted to the person it should be going to? That's one of the things you need to do in your research because uh, agents will tell you if it goes to the wrong, wrong agent, if, it, uh, if it's the wrong uh, project for the agent, uh, the wrong editor at a house, anybody. If the, if the targeting is wrong, the message is completely ignored or just worse. <laughs> you don't want to get blacklisted because you're doing stupid things. You also need to be polite in your business communication. You need to be precise in your communication. You need to be concise. Uh, you also need to be very clear as to what you're asking for, what you're expecting out of this communication, and you need to be pretty much error-free. So take the time to research any of these communications and doing it right, and that will save you a lot of the pain of rejection, which people will tell you is one of the worst things about being a writer is so much of the time you're rejected. So from now on, in all your communications rating-wise, Consider yourselves to be also not just craft people, but business people. This means that when you communicate, you're going to approach this in a very professional manner, and you're going to get a lot better results when you do that. And fiction writers, yes, this includes you. There's too many people who spend so many years of their life creating something and then dash off something substandard to agents, publishers, editors, and the book doesn't speak for itself if nobody ever gets to that point of checking out the book. They're going to check out your communication first, which may then lead to them checking out the work that you're submitting, but they may not get to that point. And much of the time, um, a lot of these places, the good thing is, is they publish their requirements. And even with that, there's a large percentage of writers who just don't read those requirements or don't adhere to the specifications. Any guess as to what happens to those ones? Round file, straight off. You never get past that point. So. The first thing to remember is always vet the advice you are getting, no matter who it's from, even this advice right here. See what happens, match it up with a real world experience, talk with a great many writers, do all your research in all the different places. So today I'm going to use some of the examples from people I know because I've gone to a lot of these conferences and interacted with professional writers at all different levels, with agents, with publishers, with editors. And it, it turns out when I'm doing my research, I keep I'm seeing a lot of names come on and go, oh, Paula, oh, I'm with her at the MWA, and oh, Libby Cudmore, oh, she's my friend from that, that conference. Oh my gosh, this is great. So uh, I'm always learning and improving. I'm always trying to get more information all the time. And the fact is, is you can do all of this in seven years. That shows you what you can do. So there are no barriers anymore. Nobody can say no to you so much of the time that you can't get anything done. You can do exactly what you decide that you're going to do in writing. You can make your own world. That's the best part. So uh, we'll start with a novel and we'll start with uh, the queries. Uh, because a lot of people, the book proposal, as we know, is, is the hardest part. And this goes with other things as well. Even it can work for nonfiction, things like that. You can substitute proposal for query in a lot of this. But once the novel's finished, first of all, you don't query an unfinished novel. Uh, because you're going to get to the point where uh, okay, great, let me see it. And then you suddenly go, oh, it's not ready. And <laughs> let me tell you, agents did not want to hear that. It's like, well, why did you query me now then? You're wasting my time. Never, never waste their time. So when the book is completely, utterly polished, when it's proofed, when it's line edited, 
when it's perfect, when, when other writers are, are seeking to get that, that agent uh, that, or that manuscript in the editor's hands. So one point you want to, might want to know, I'm, I put this in because I've known a lot of writers and, and talked to many. Uh, people use agents for contract negotiations, and here's a caveat on that. Anybody could be an agent. I could set up it as an agent tomorrow and have a couple of dozen clients in a month or two. There are no professional standards. Well, they have voluntary organizations, with, but there's not enforceable standards on that. You don't need a license to become an agent. Uh, anybody, a lot of people just say, I'm going to be an agent. So be very, very careful in what your representation is if you are querying somebody to find out for your financial and career future. This is, this is important because uh, in contract negotiation, should you be lucky enough to get one of them, agents are not lawyers. Contracts are enforceable legal documents and they are very much affecting of you. And while everybody, you say, well, everybody was nice when I signed the contract, but if somebody at that publishing place comes in who's not nice and starts enforcing all of the contract, you suddenly could be up a creek that you do not want to be up. So use, use caution. Um, one of the better suggestions of many professionals is to have a contract, any contract in writing, vetted by a professional. Somebody in the writing world would be an intellectual property attorney who knows what they're doing. And again, the resource list will give you some places to, to go and find this. Uh, it's going to cost a few hundred dollars to have somebody vet a contract, but it could save you thousands of dollars in years of your life and potentially your, your future. Um, uh, the trouble is, is that when you give a contract to an agent, an agent usually only gets paid if you sign the contract. What do you think they're going to tell you to do? <laughs> sure, sign the contract. It's like, because otherwise they're not going to get paid. I know a few exceptions, but uh, most often uh, people with their livelihood at stake are going to advise you to do what's best for them, not what's best for you. This might be a terrible contract, and there's a lot of terrible contracts out there and they're getting worse. Uh, they tell you, oh, that's just the way it's done. This is boilerplate. That's standard. Everybody signs this. Oh, and if you don't, it's a take it or leave it contract. Don't believe them, or if you do believe them, walk away. Because if, if something's that bad, it can affect you a lot more. A bad contract will tie you down more worse than anything else. And again, remember, this is a business. And if you were in a business, you would not want to sign a bad contract that's going to affect your future that much. <coughs> you could lose all your rights. Yes, yes. What's the sign of a bad contract? Like, what are a couple of, like... Having a professional vet it who knows what they're doing. And they go, oh, you do not want to look at this. We can try to change that. We can ask them for modifications. But um, all rights, they're doing all rights grabs, even if they're not going to produce it. Say, if you do a book, uh, the audio rights, they have no intention of doing audio unless the book sells a great many copies, but they want the rights anyway because companies know that the intellectual property of your copyright is worth money to them. But to you, it's worth a lot more. So you might say, well, I want the audio rights because I may want to make sure that the book is done in audio and there's ways of doing that. But uh, that's just one example. Uh, foreign film rights, I mean, they will try to wrap them all up in a bundle even if they're not going to do anything with them. Even if the book doesn't sell, they want to sit on those. Now, when a company is sitting on your rights, you don't have as many options to, to do something with that. And I know many authors, their books are no longer in print, they can't advertise them, and nothing's happening with them. Nobody can buy them because they signed a bad contract. So again, just caution and do your research. And that's one of the things we know. Uh, we can't go into all of contract law now, but uh, in my resource list, I'll point you towards a couple of books you need to read and understand uh, contract and copyright law which are cornerstones of what you need to do in a business. <coughs> Again, if this is a business, every transaction you do can affect your future. So please, do the smart things. <laughs> uh, the trouble is, is that first-time writers are so eager to get published, they'll sign anything. You, you know, it's, it's like the, uh, the music business. It's like, oh my god, we want a major label to sign us. Oh, a contract, yeah. And then they find out, oh my god, I've got a tour for four years. I have to do exactly what the company tells me to produce and I'm getting very little money for that afterwards. It can happen, and you can get tied up. Yes? When I was in Iowa City, there was a guy who there, and he stayed in the well. He drove around town with his tailpipe duct taped to his car, 
You may know who he is. I know David. Yeah, I've met him at conferences, and he's a wonderful man. Yeah, absolutely. He's the creator of Rambo. Excellent. Well, yeah, so he created Rambo, the uh, book, and uh, from which Sylvester Stallone did the movie. But David Morrell did the original book. And he's a wonderful man. He's had a long-term career, and that was his breakout novel. Uh, for many, he's done a, he's done a lot since, and he goes to conferences and offers his, his advice. But yeah, um, driving around town with a tailpipe hanging off, and it's like, I'm, I've met so many writer millionaires, and you would never know it. They dress sometimes like homeless people, and you're like, that's a famous writer. It's like, uh, <laughs> try the hygiene or something. But you'll find out more, and that's the best part about talking with professionals who've actually been doing this for a long time. You learn the ins and outs. That's why I urge people to go to uh, classes like this. Seven Bridge is a learning experience. A writing convention, a conference, while it may be costly, is a learning experience. And I've learned so much when I started going to these conferences. Went, they're going to share all this information that they've, it's taken them 20 years to learn, and they're going to give this to me? Huh, you betcha. Absolutely. It's the best way to learn and experience. The Internet is a, is a wonderful way to learn. Uh, your local library has much information and resources that they can point you to. Uh, large bookstores with great uh, writing departments uh, will have a lot of books on the craft, and you can go through and look and find out uh, a lot of those, just about a book on every subject under the sun. So if you have a question on synopses and you want to know about it, they've got books telling you how to write a synopsis and a whole book which you can absorb at your own time to be able to do that. It's great. It's th we live in a world of information. This is the information age and most people are still hesitant about getting out and getting that information to help them in their careers. <coughs> so agents, I did have an agent. Uh, I was able to, to get one at one time and I discovered that New York takes so long to produce something, no matter how interested they are, uh, that you could be dead by the time that anything happens in your career. And he was, a, he was a nice person. He was representing my work. He loved it. He thought it was professional. But again, I felt, uh, since the world was turning back at the time when I was trying to publish, that there were other options coming aboard now. Uh, the self-publishing or independent uh, author used to be frowned upon as a vanity press, and now the vanity press is expecting New York to pat you on the back and give you lots of money. I can tell you right now, if you're looking to be rich and famous with a book or two, uh, like J.D. Salinger, you write a little and then you retire to a farm in New Hampshire for the rest of your life and, and live off that and never have to talk to people, it's not going to happen. It's, writers today are expected, like David Morrell goes to conferences. He doesn't have to, but he still goes to conferences to learn, to speak, to distribute his books. Um, you don't have to be an extrovert. I mean, most writers are introverts. We like to sit in a room and create things out of our head. But many times, if you're in a business transaction with a publisher, uh, with any company that's helping to produce your work, no matter what format or, or media style, they're going to want you to get out and be a business person and communicate with other people. This is why courses like this are important, because you're going to have to know how to do that. So we'll experience a few of those. So I went beyond my agent, and I'm much happier now. In fact, I go talk to a lot of writers, and everybody's complaining. Oh, my publisher does this. My agent does this. Oh, the bookstore does this and doesn't sell my books. And I've seen New York Times bestseller who's top of the list come into a room and start griping about the bookstore they just went to that didn't have their books placed exactly the way they wanted. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Learn to be happy with your career. You're creating. You're doing something. Do that and be the happy business person because you made the right choices and the smart choices for you. You know, it's not all about money. It's about protecting your creations. Okay. Um, I'll tell you one good secret. This is this will be very helpful. People spend a lot of time on query letters. Sometimes they spend years querying to get an agent to get them to an editor or a publisher. That is a step which it takes people many years. Again, if you go to these conferences, you'll get to talk to agents one on one. You get to go to pitch sessions where you sit down with them and they'll give you three to five minutes, something like that, to talk about your work with them face to face. If you've done your homework and you've perfected your pitch and you can go in there, you've just gotten past that point of a blind query. They used to call it over the transom, like submissions of books would come to publishers over the transom. They'd get all these unsolicited manuscripts and they'd pile them up. It was called a slush pile, still is. And now, they were smart because what they did was they passed all that off to agents and editors. They said, well, now you've got to submit to them first before 
we look at it. So they use a screening process so they don't have to do any of the work. But here's the secret. When you submit to agents, so are hundreds or thousands of other people. I know agents that look at hundreds and hundreds of queries a week. So you know what they do a lot of times? They give it to the junior assistant. Your query that you so carefully crafted about your work that you've spent so much time on is being looked at by a 24-year-old who's maybe a year out of college who's bored or looking at their phone or something like that and goes, oh, that's not the kind of thing I like. So you can skip all of that process by going to conferences and actually pitching to live agents. Wonderful process. You've, you've just jumped ahead of the queue so far. And then again, what the rules that we're going to look at, all the rest of your things have to be good. Your, the rest of your communication has to be right up to snuff. But that's, that's one of the big secrets. So the query letter, the blind query letter, is pretty much a lottery process. And what we've seen is, is A, if they're looking at hundreds, you've got to stand out. Uh, you're probably not going to. Anybody know what the average resume gets looked at? about 10 to 15 seconds. And that's for a resume. That's for a job that somebody wants you in to do something for them, and they're giving it that much, 10 to 15 seconds. That's a scan. I'll tell you, most queries, you're lucky if you get that. Because they can tell from how long it is and just the first couple of paragraphs if you're good enough or not. Um, my uh, MWA member friend, Paula um, Munier, who is an agent and now also a first-time debut novelist, says that only about one in every 200 queries is well-written enough, well-conceived enough, and well-targeted enough to prompt her to ask to see more material. She says that many writers simply write a one-size-fits-all query. Uh, they set up a mail merge that includes every agent they've seen in literary marketplace, all, uh, all the ones they get, and they hit send. They have not done their homework, and they know nothing about the kind of projects that she represents. So. That's from a professional who says, listen to her. So we've done that. We're going to get into there. I'm going to give you some advice from another person I met at a conference. This is, this is great because you meet the professionals, Jane Friedman. And you're going to want to check out her blog. That will be in the resource list. Uh, she writes a blog that is just so helpful to uh, writers in so many aspects, from the craft side to the business side. That's going to be one of your places, your go-to place for research from now on because you'll save yourself hundreds of hours and, and a lot of frustration if you read what's, what she recommends and avoid what she recommends to avoid. So, her, her comments. Even though the, you should have a finished and polished manuscript before you begin querying, writers always ask if they're the exception. The answer is no. You are not the exception. But what if I'm two-thirds done? Or what if the manuscript's being copy edited and, and it's almost finished? Well, go ahead if you want. But if somebody asks for something right away and you don't do it again, you are looking foolish. You are, you are getting, losing your chance if you have not done the homework, if you haven't done the right thing. So if that can make for a very awkward or high-pressure situation, so wait. Let it bake. Make sure that it's ready. Make sure and you're a professional. I mean, would you want people to come into a restaurant that you just opened if you weren't really ready? Uh, yeah, they're still doing some stuff in the kitchen, but I, I, just take a, take a seat. You know, we'll have stuff out soon. No, that would, that would be silly. So think of this as, as another type of business. Do not put anything out for professional evaluation to the people before it is absolutely ready. And again, just remember, you in this room are absorbing that, and you're way ahead of the pack because... 199 of the other people have not learned that yet. So already you're ahead of the pack. You're putting yourself in the small percentage that's going to get checked out. So, five elements of every basic, basic query letter. Number one is, again, you can write this down. I will send people uh, a copy of this so, so you can do it, but uh, keep track. It's always good to write things down because then your brain remembers it more. So. Five basic elements, what you are selling. This includes the genre or the category, whatever you, you know it is because you've done your research, the word count, the title, subtitle, one thing. Another thing is the hook, the meat of the query. We'll get into this. Uh, one to 200 words is sufficient for most uh, novel hooks for what you're putting down. A bio. 
it's, uh, it's optional if you're not published anywhere for fiction writers. If you do publish, uh, that's, we'll get into that. There's a lot more that you can do. The personalization for the person you're sending to. This is also option, but you can customize this letter for your recipient and then a thank you in closing. Those are basics. Now, it sounds pretty easy, but again, think of how many people aren't even getting that part right. So opening your query letter, put your best foot forward, lead with your strongest selling point. What, why are you submitting to this person? This is part of the targeting. Why this person in particular? You say, because I want an agent. They want to know why you want this agent. Remember, you're asking them for something and they're like, well, they could get any one of a thousand people. Why would they want you? Why do you want them? Why do you want to work with them? They want to know this. So maybe you've been referred to by somebody else, uh, an existing client or author, or uh, vouch for by one of them says, oh, yeah, so that, that, that person has some good stuff. If that's the case, if you've been referred by somebody else, mention that. Mention that referral right away because then they know another professional has seen your work and says, okay, at least give this a look. If you met this uh, agent or editor at a conference or a pitch event and your material was requested, you put that up front. You're going to put that also in the subject line of the letter or the email that you send as well. Requested material. Then they know it's not just a blind query. There was something that happened and you say, hi, I met you at the blank blank conference and we had a nice talk and you requested a uh, partial submission, so here's my first 30 pages. I've seen a lot of people that have done that very successfully doing that. If you've uh, just heard them speak at a conference but you haven't actually spoken to them, or if you read an interview or uh, a post uh, on, a, on a blog site or a website and, and it indicates that they are a very good fit for the kind of work you are doing, mention that. This is part of the things of why you're targeting this person. Um, a lot of people start with a story hook. That's a very classic opening, but that hook has to really be compelling or else you're losing. So we'll, we'll do more on that later. And of course, uh, any uh, publishing or credentials that you may have, uh, especially if you've won awards, received a MFA from a, from a very good school or anything about that. A lot of people don't want to talk about themselves if they're unpublished because they feel inadequate. And that, again, that's not a problem. Don't talk about your, your credits if you don't have any. So we'll get, again, we'll get deeper into that. Yeah. Um, what if you have um, like a blog or that you've written for magazines, that kind of thing? Okay. First of all, if you have a blog, any agent worth their salt or anybody that you wish uh, will represent you is going to check you out. They're going to check out your website. They're going to check out your blog. They're going to judge for themselves. So you don't really have to put that in there because they're going to know. Now, if you have credits, absolutely. Oh, I've been in Ellery Queen Magazine and Mystery uh, Scene and in The Strand, things like that. That's something they're going to want to know. But if it's in you know, your local newspaper, things like that, uh, you don't really want to oversell any very small time writing. But uh, anything that's a, that's a legitimate credit for something, uh, story placements, uh, good articles that have been seen in legitimate journals, absolutely. Again, um, a lot of the resource material will tell you how to refine that, what's good and what's not good. So we can, we can get into that a little more. So if you don't have any of that, most people are going to rely on that hook, that right up front hook, because they don't have the, the credits or anything. And some writers will start simple and direct saying, my blank title is an 80,000 word supernatural romance. Boom. Right away, you've told the agent, you're putting your flag up, running it up, and if they say, well, I don't like supernatural romance, you've targeted the wrong person, first of all. And if they do, they go, okay. They know the word count for this type of genre. They know what I represent. They know the kind of things I'm looking at. I see the information I have in one sentence. Move on. You want to get them from the first sentence to the next sentence to the next sentence. This is part of communicating with somebody in a, in a business communication. Not that they stop reading after line one, which can happen in some communications. Oh, you have to sit right up front now. Oh, boy. Everyone. <laughs> OK. So personalizing the query letter, yes or no. So your query letter is a sales tool. Good salespeople develop a rapport with people they want to sell to and show that they understand their needs. Again, you're not just asking them for something to do for you. 
what are you doing for this other person at the end of this communication? Again, this is applicable not just to query letters, but to all of it. Yes? Um, I'm familiar with the agents that have been using the Twitter feed, and they're just like so nice and accessible, and I'm sending out an email query, and I address them, dear Liz, or dear Ms. something. I don't know which one. I get stuck at that point. Good. Do you know why you do? Because they've all got different requirements. <laughs> yeah, that's why. They don't say what they're A lot of times they don't, and this, this is the hard part because some agents do not like you to say, dear, name, 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 you know, the full name. Some will like, dear Liz. Some will like, dear Miss Elizabeth. Dear, don't just say, dear editor <laughs> or dear agent. Um, that's the part. That's, that is the hard part because everybody's got different requirements. Now, a lot of times, uh, these people are going to publish their requirements and guidelines on their website, on their blog, in interviews, things like that. This is part of doing your research of what else does this agent represent? And if you find that out, you may get clues on that. Uh, I'd like to thank Liz, my agent, instead of Miss Elizabeth you know, Perkins, you know, my agent, blah, blah, blah. So that would give you a, a tip. Yep. Go for the professional, remember, professionals, yeah. If you've just met somebody at a, at a business conference, until they say, call me Ted or call me Liz, you don't use that. So, Mr. So-and-so, Ms. So-and-so, blah, blah, blah. Official titles at all times um, with the name. But uh, yes, it's very hard, and that's one of the things. That's a stumbling block, and they expect you to just, some of them expect you to just know this. Yeah, when you have a 24-year-old agent who tells you all about her dog and her little trips to the whatever, yeah, that's dear Liz. You could probably, yeah, dear Kathy, dear Liz, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, but um, the, the really good ones who've been in the business for 42 years, and I do expect a certain level, remember that courtesy, that politeness and professionalism? Again, yeah, so that's a very hard thing. But as in all business, you know, communications, you know, default on the side of deference, at least, to their position, to what they're doing. Good, good, great questions from everybody, so. Um, Here's one example of a personalized lead. So, in a January interview at the Guide to Literary Agents blog, you praised the 13th tale and indicated an interest in literary fiction with a genre plot. My paranormal romance, Moonlight Dancer, of 80,000 words, blends a literary style with a romance tradition. Personalized. It's like, you mentioned something. I listened. I know the kind of thing you like because you said this. Here's what I have, which is like that. Personalized, targeted, bang. Much better chance of success. Those, those two, three lines are going to get them to read, the, read on. OK, great. Now let's check it out a little more. But if you try to personalize your query saying, oh, I found your name in writer's market, <laughs> right? along with all the other 255 listings, it's like I just picked your name out of the hat because I went down the list and you were you know, 14th in the alphabet kind of thing. They're not going to be interested in that. Uh, there's no meaningful context there, so don't say anything like that. Okay, so again, we can't always know. We can try. We can do our homework and research. So if the information is out there, we should know. But again, you can't always. And so that's why going to the conferences helps a lot, too, asking them. And when you meet them at a conference, you, you start off, and they will tell you, oh, call me Paula. Okay, great. Thank you. Now you know. <coughs> Another part of business communication is if you're going to be a, quote, business slash sometimes salesperson, identify what it is that you're actually selling. So put that book title, word count, and genre, state it right up front, unless you're putting the hook up front and saving that for later. But that's information, required information that needs to be in there. Everybody knows that when you submit a title, it's a working title, which will probably be changed by the publishing house anyway in most cases. So don't worry about that. It's just a tentative title. Yes, everybody knows that, so you don't have to say it right out. Excuse me. The word count is industry standard for different genres. Fantasy novels usually run about 100,000 words. Uh, mystery novels can run uh, anywhere from 50,000 to about 75, 80,000 words. Most publishers now want debut novels and the average novel coming out to be around 80,000 words. So if you're at a variance with that, 
you're already saying, warning, warning, you're sending up a flag. You want to send up as few flags as possible. Question? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what would be the average hold count for home and cars? Wow. I would say anywhere from five words <laughs> on up <laughs> to as, as big as you want. But you don't find many anthologies by a single person this thick. So if you've got something, uh, again, the word count, because poems are very distinct formats, so yeah. you're going to have to do the research on that. You're going to have to go into a bookstore and find a couple by different authors. And, and mm -hmm. by estimating word counts, there's formulas for doing that online, you can, you can guesstimate. Okay, so they've got 40 poems, uh, which run from one page to three pages. So you've got about 180 pages in this booklet. And so you can guesstimate the uh, word count from that, from looking at that and figuring how many words per page. Okay. Right? Thank you, okay, sure, no problem. Um, different genres do have different word counts. I mean, romance, fantasy, science fiction, horror, things like that. Literary, I mean, literary can be anything. Now, some agents and publishers are complaining because people are turning in these 150,000 word literary novels. It's like, well, that's because you started giving awards to the big fat novels. So guess what happens to the herd? They all start writing the big fat novels. And so you have only yourselves to blame on that. So um, if you've got something that's so different in that field, bury that information at the end. You do want that in there because they're going to want to see that. But try to get them interested first. And if they get interested and excited, then you can hit them with the fact that, yeah, you're not quite up to the standard there. You're, you're, you're doing a little variance. Again, any red flags you put up might put you out of the running. So do what you can to downplay that. If you're not sure of the genre, leave out the mention of it. But again, this is part of your homework. Does this agent represent a particular type of genre? Most of the time, they're going to tell you that they represent this, this, and this. They do not represent X, Y, and Z. So if you send them a query for X, Y, and Z, you're wasting your time and theirs. You can say that your book is written in the same manner or style as another specific book or author, or that it has a similar tone or a theme, but just don't overdo it. One or two comparisons, that should be enough. And the more thoughtful the comparison, uh, the better it is. But comparing yourself to a New York Times bestseller, author can come across as arrogant or easy. If you just say, I've got the next David Morrell book, and they're going to go, really? <laughs> well, what, what does he feel about that? You're, you're just putting yourself out of the running. So it's the nuance. It's the understanding of where your book falls in the literary landscape. You know what the, the best way to find that out is? Walk into a big bookstore and find books that you think are like your book and read them. Look at the packaging, read the acknowledgments, read the forewords, read the end notes, read the uh, blurbs on the front and back. Is your book in that field? Is your book similar to that? Can you envision your book the same size, the same price, uh, the same kind of packaging for that? If you can't, you may have a little more work to do to figure that out. Go around to the other sections of the bookstore and find out which ones do. And with agents, a lot of times they're being thanked in these forwards and acknowledgments. So you can find out what books these agents represent. Sometimes they'll say it on their website and blog. Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper and look in Literary Marketplace or some of these publishing deals and see who represents who to find out who's doing what. And if you say, that's the kind of book that I have. Excellent. I want to I submit to this agent. Now you've got the homework. You've, you've connected it up. Okay, it's 11.25. We're going to take five-minute break so you can get up, stretch, get those blood vessels going so you don't get deep vein thrombosis here. And we'll come right back and get right into some more crafting the story hook. So next step, crafting that story hook. How do you get somebody interested in something that you've created? So for most writers, the hook does all the work in convincing the agent or editor request your manuscript. And it boils down to some very key elements the protagonist or protagonists, their conflict and the choices they have to make, what is at stake for them, and the sizzle. So sometimes it's important to clarify uh, a setting or time period. Say if you've got science fiction, important to ground in that world, or if it's historical, ground them in time and place, and do that right up front. Um, you may do a little bit of world building, but not too much. You just want to give them a feel or a flavor of the kind of thing. Again. Just let them know what's going on. So think of this, the, the hook is in terms of what does your character want? Why do they want it? And what keeps them from getting it? 
Uh, I think it was Kurt Vonnegut who said, you can do, make your character want something, your protagonist, even if it's just a glass of water, but make them want it very, very badly. Put obstacles in their way to keep them from doing it and then show why they can't doing it. And you as the reader will want to want them to get towards that goal if you've done your, your work right and your protagonist is good. So um, I think it was Mark Twain who said, uh, you know, it's always best to give a lot of troubles to your protagonist. Chase them up a tree and then throw rocks at them, <laughs> which is a way of give them a lot of obstacles, a lot of trouble, and the reader will be on their side because they've had their struggles and they want to identify, they want to move along with it. So that's what the hook is, is to make a compelling story. Everybody says, I've got a great story. Boom, you have to boil that down so quickly for them. So the sizzle part of that, which we talked about, is that thing that sets your work apart from others in the genre, that makes your story stand out, that makes it uniquely yours, your voice, your story. Uh, it's, it's not an idea that's been done a million times before. So how do you know if your idea is, is tired? Well, if this is why we tell all writers to read and read and read and then read some more because it builds your knowledge and experience of what has been done before, particularly in your genre, as well as the conventions of that genre. So if a hook is well written but uh, boring, seen it before because it lacks anything fresh, same old formula, no distinction. Uh, the protagonist may feel one-dimensional like everybody else, or the story angle is something we've just seen too many times before, and the premise is like, oh, God, another one of these. The agent or editor is like, I have seen this so many times. They will tell you because they have. The toughest part of the hook is, is finding that certain je ne sais quoi that makes someone say, wow, I think we got something here. Let's, let's read on. And this is how an agent gauges if you're a storyteller worth spending their time on. If you interest them, you're going to interest readers. If you bore them, you're going to bore readers. Nobody's going to want to buy that book. They don't want to represent that book. They don't want to put their professional reputation on the line for something new that is not going to sell. So if a, a hook has no life or personality or voice, what we call voice for writers, uh, in it, it's not going to go anywhere. But the ones that do go somewhere is because either lively or they have something going on, they have a personality that makes you want more. So um, here's one example from Lori Shear's The Writer's Advantage, and she demonstrates the difference between a, a, a boring story hook and an exciting one. I've heard an eternity of pitches featuring women as victims, survivors, single mothers, and if somebody pitches me a story about a 43-year-old unmarried woman who's had a successful career in advertising or law or pharmaceuticals or whatever and decides at the last minute that her biological clock is ticking and she wants to have a child, I will wait for the writer to tell me the rest of the story. And there is no rest of the story because in their mind, that is the story. To which I say, who cares? Remember, this is Laurie Shear talking, not me. Seriously, nobody cares about the storyline. We've seen numerous stories about women wanting to have children later in life, and she could produce a list of two pages long of books and movies with the same plot line. However, if one of the main characters is a 43-year-old single businesswoman having her first child, and at the same time her 22-year-old niece is having her first child, but because the niece doesn't see the benefit of having a career and only wants to be supported by a rich husband, now what's that? Conflict conflict and that's the heart of good stories. So when we teach classes about critique hooks, everybody can point out the hook's problems and talk about how to improve them because when you're not the writer, you have distance from the work. But when you are the writer, you can't see the flaws in your own things. Same as all computer programmers. They can't see the bugs in their own program, so don't worry. <laughs> but when you come across a great novel hook, it just feels natural and easy and like it had to be. It's, oh, that, was, that was simple, but it's not. Examples of brief story hooks. So Publishers Marketplace is a good uh, place for resources and it lists book deals that were recently signed and it identifies the title, the author, the publisher, editor who bought the project, research, and the agent who sold it, more research. It also offers a one sentence description of the book. These hooks are well crafted and can get you to better understand what the kind of hooks are that really excite the agents and publishers. So here's, here's just two brief examples. Uh, this book, an emotionally controversial novel about a, a doula slash midwife with a sixth sense 
who, while following her calling, has to confront a dark and uncertain future when standing trial for the death of her best friend's baby. Boom. They say, that's cool. That's something I haven't seen before. There's a lot of conflict in there. I understand the stakes. I understand what's going on. That's the kind of thing that does it. Another one which sold. And this book, Southern Gods, in which a Memphis DJ hires a recent World War II veteran to find a mysterious blues man whose music, broadcast at ever-shifting frequencies by a phantom radio station, is said to make living men insane and dead men rise. Who does not want to read that book, right? I am going to go get that, actually, and find that out. That's the kind of thing that sells. They go, I want to read it. I know other people are going to read it. Now I want to buy it. That's the kind of thing. Good hooks. <coughs> Checking for red flags in your book. How to tell if your hook could be improved. Does your hook consist of several meaty paragraphs or run longer than 200 words? You may be going into too much detail. Does your hook reveal the ending of your book? Only the synopsis should do that. Does your hook mention more than three characters? No. Usually you only need to mention the protagonist, a romantic interest or sidekick, and the antagonist. What are the stakes? Don't go into too much detail. Remember, this is a hook. This isn't your book. <laughs> Does your hook get into minor plot points that don't affect the choices the protagonist makes? Do you really need to mention those right now? Does your hook talk about the story rather than telling the story? Don't get bogged down in how you wrote the book or what the themes are. Focus on what happens. Keep it brief. Okay, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, just the hook part of it now. Remember, another part, one of those essential parts, was writing your own author bio. So, <coughs> Put everything in there that's meaningful that will matter. If you can't tell, probably leave it out. In order of importance, these are some of the pertinent things. Any credits you have, be very specific about what is meaningful. Don't say you've been published in a, a variety of journals. You might as well be unpublished if you don't want to name them. If you have no fiction writing credits, don't state that. Uh, that'll be made clear because you left it out. Uh, I've sold over 70 uh, published stories, and that's in my bio. It's like I've written six novels, over 70 published stories. That makes them go right in the first sentence, oh, okay, somebody's paying for this guy's stuff, so it must, must be good. So that's a, that's a hook right at the start where you do it. If they want, I can certainly name them some you know, prestigious journals and things like that, but I don't need to at this point because they know with 70, you're getting into a lot of places. It's not just you know, the, the Iowa Farm Journal or you know, just a local, oh, he said Iowa. <laughs> Name check, shout out. <laughs> Any nonfiction writing credits? Uh, some people wonder if that's useful. Uh, it depends if, if it's uh, useful. Um, academic or trade journal credits, maybe but they don't uh, convey fiction writing ability. So if you're crossing over from fiction to nonfiction, writing well in one area does not guarantee you can write well in another. So use your discretion and again, do your research to find out if that will matter to this person. Uh, don't do like church newsletters or credits that just, just don't hold any, any water. It's like if, if they're in Manhattan, they do not care about the, the local newsletter. Uh, Self-published books, if you've already done some, uh, this information will come out uh, because if they're doing their research. So um, it doesn't hurt as much anymore with everyone. Uh, there are still a, a couple of snobs left, but don't worry about them because targeting, you don't want to submit to them anyway. But um, if you're trying to get an agent or publisher for a book or series that's already been self-published, don't even bother. They're not interested unless it's selling 100,000 copies, i.e. The Martian. Okay, uh, they don't want something that's already been out in the world. They want new, they want fresh, and they want the new and fresh to look just like everything else that they've sold. <laughs> right. <laughs> the one that already sold 50,000 copies, they want it all new and fresh, but it's got to be just like that one. Okay, like a lot of the music business, same thing. It's like, oh, can you write another hit like that? Sure, sure, I can do that, yeah. It'll sound just the same. Um, Self-publishing credits do not make you more desirable as an author unless you have that great sales success. Uh, in which case, mention the numbers, but they have many tools at their disposal, uh, book scan, things like that, which tell them each week how many books are selling. So if you say, well, I've self-published three books and they can't even find sales numbers and they look on Amazon and your book is 10 million down on the list, they know it's not selling and they know they don't want to, probably don't want to represent you. So, your profession. 
only in your author bio, me mention your profession if it's applicable to the kind of book you're selling. If you're a deep sea diver and international spy and you wrote a thriller, by all means put that in. If, you're writing a, if you've been a golfer and you're writing a spy thriller and it has nothing to do with it, don't. Um, don't go into lengthy detail. Uh, teachers of K-12 who are writing children or YA books sometimes mention their teaching experience as a credential. Not really. Not as much. So don't leave that out. I mean, you know, yes, they know what the kids like to read, but that's it. That doesn't mean that they will be able to write the kind of thing that kids like to read. It's not a guarantee. Uh, <laughs> parents should not treat parent status as a success for writing a successful children's book. Just saying that. It's like, well, I have a child, so of course I can write a children's book. No, no, don't do that. Uh, men do mention any writing-related degrees you have or professional uh, major writing organizations. Uh, Romance Writers of America, uh, Mystery Writers of America, Science Fiction Writers of America, uh, Society of Children's Book Writers and uh, Illustrators, anything like that, which helps because now they know that you're at least talking to professionals. They assume that you're going to be talking with professionals and doing the research you need to do. Uh, don't just say that you go and check out blogs from time to time. That's not good enough. Or look at a couple of writing sites. No. Nope. Um, Seven Bridge. Uh, if you say, I am personally involved with a community again, you're getting into an area which they're not really interested in. Uh, yes, it's great that you're learning, but as far as professional credentials, probably not. If it was on a national level and you've been publishing articles for, uh, you know, Writer's Digest or something like that, that's the kind of thing you want to mention. But again, think of the stakes. Think of what is going to impress them. People in Manhattan aren't impressed by anything outside of Manhattan, <laughs> first of all, uh, just to let you know. <coughs> Special research. If um, you do particular types of unusual research, if you're an archaeologist and you have a great thriller you know, that involves archaeology, absolutely put that in. Uh, you spent a year in the Congo and the book is set in Africa or, you know, someplace like that, an exotic locale, and you lived there, definitely mention that. Uh, unique details can catch attention, uh, something out of the ordinary, but only if it's germane to what you did. You know, again, if, if you were a golfer in Morocco and you're writing a book that's, you know, set in South America, yeah, not so much. <laughs> yes, you in the front. What's your name again? worthy of a national credential. I'm saying consider, consider. However, um, what, how would you react to um, using a regional organization like Seven Bridge to mm. uh, talk about um, your experience as a writer in connecting with other writers, in um, learning from other writers, in um, being an environment that kind of brings writers along? How would you react Great to Great question. That? Now, think of what they're doing. If you're trying to become a professional and acting as a professional, you should be doing that. That would be almost an assumption that you should be doing that. And for you to start spelling that out, you don't have time in the query letter. You know what? That's great for a follow-up conversation if they invite you to lunch or they say, tell me some more about your background. Now that's the opportunity. But putting it right out front, absolutely not. Again, Manhattan. <coughs> and it's not me. It's because they're snobs and they don't really care. <laughs> they ex all they want to know is, can you write, and I can tell that from the, this three to four hundred word query letter on one page, and then that will tell me if I want to even look at a sample of what the writing is. They don't really care, and unfortunately, but that's the case of what it is, and that's why you need to know this kind of thing. Another thing to put in your bio, if you have won any major awards or presentations that are germane to writing, you know, not a third, third grade participation trophy. Nope, they don't want to care. Um, if the award isn't widely recognizable to the majority of publishing professionals, if you won the best writer at Seven Bridges, you know, for you know 2018, I still don't think they they might even be interested in that. But if it was a more national or for something totally recognized, if you won the Man Booker Prize, you would definitely put that in. Um, but entry numbers of of contests and things only if if you've won out over thousands and thousands of people, not, not several dozen or several hundred. That's the kind of thing. If you want a Writer's Digest contest, that's the kind of thing that's going to uh, excite them. But if you don't have meaningful credits, don't try to invent them. They, they can sniff out bullshit quicker than anybody. Sorry for the phrasing, but um, if you don't have uh, research to mention or awards or anything like that, don't, don't try to pump it up. 
uh, they, they can tell. Just, just end the letter and you're still respectable. It's just the work will stand on itself if you have interested them in what you have to offer. Uh, avoid cataloging every single thing you've done in your writing life. I don't list all 70 publishing stories and all the novels. You just tell them. You just give them big numbers that they go, ooh. <laughs> uh, don't talk about starting to write when you're in second grade or how much you've improved your writing in the last years or uh, how much you enjoy returning to writing in your retirement because now you have time, that kind of thing. Just mention a few highlights to, to show how serious you are and boom, done. Brief, concise, precise. If your bio can really reveal something of your personality that's going to attract them, that's okay. Now, writing the query letter isn't, isn't the place to start getting chatty, but if there's something to be said about expressing yourself into the kind of author you are, and charm helps. And I'll give you an example a, a little bit later. Yeah, we have time for that. Um, novel queries do not have to express market concerns. That's their job. They're going to figure out where it fits, what the, uh, what the print run is going to be, how many it'll sell, and if they want to do it. Don't be tempted to elaborate on the audience or market. You might mention fans of X book will like this because you've done your research and you know that that's a similar type. The, the tone and theme and style and voice is similar to X or Y, not more than one or two. Don't talk about trends in the market or target audiences, again, unless you say this is specifically designed for everybody from, from 8 to 12 in that market because they get very specific. The YA market and uh, the middle grade market, I mean, they do get very specific on what they have. <coughs> but again, know the genre type. Say it's a, quote, futuristic science fiction in the vein of blank. See what I mean? You're not getting into too much detail, but you're grounding them into what it really is, not what it isn't. Yes? What if there are television shows that are similar or showing like a, a popular um, interest in the subject? Yep, absolutely. If you can write like that, if you can write a script to that, spec scripts, again, uh, television and, and scripts, blind scripts, are so different because it is such a different mentality of the marketplace of what they're going to get to accept. So you really have to attend those workshops and conferences where those people go and talk to them and find out the kind of things you like. And that would be a great question to ask one of them. If, if you get, go to a, a convention and you ask a showrunner, so if I'm, if I'm doing a blind query to you, should I mention that this is like X and Y? And they'll tell you. Unfortunately, that's so outside of what we can do, and I haven't yet sold anything to television or films, so I can't give you a better answer at this time. Uh, when you're querying, again, this is the initial, initial contact with somebody. Don't really discuss marketing plans and platforms a lot. Uh, you might mention your website, but of course, they're going to find out if you feel confident that it is professional. Or your blog, you know, if you're just talking about your dog the whole time and not writing, maybe if they like dogs, they'll, they'll go for it. Uh, but yeah, they're going to Google you. They're going to find out uh, if you've sold, you know, the, the kind of person you're presenting yourself to the world as. And if you've got uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn profiles, things like that, smart people will check you out if they're going to do business with you. They're going to they're gonna check you. Uh, and they'll find out if you're a good marketer and promoter of your work. And if you have a sizable readership, that's something important. Now, now you know, but you just don't say, hey, I know how to write a good story. They're the judge of that. But if you've got 100,000 fans <coughs> and readers and, and people are buying your book, that's something you do want to let them know. So close your letter professionally after you've done all that. You've done, you've done the hook. Right? You've, done, you've told them everything they need to do. You've done your bio. You've got all the information there. It's all on one page. Now close your letter professionally. You think it's easy, but there's a couple of things. Don't state that you're querying uh, simultaneously. That is expected for the most part. Don't send out one single query to one agent because you will be 155 before you ever hear a <laughs> decent response. Multiple queries, and they understand that uh, a lot of them do not even respond at all, so you'll be waiting forever. And some respond with a curt rejection or a one word, no thanks, not for us. Uh, so yes, it is okay to query multiple agents, but again, don't just shotgun it out, target. Target to the agents you want. Create your master list of the, say, dozen agents that you would really like to see represent your work because you've done all the homework. Now hit the first four to six of those in one batch. Wait four weeks, eight weeks, whatever, and query the next batch. 
And if that doesn't work, you move on, you make another list, or you decide what else you're going to do, change. But send out a bunch of queries at a time, and they expect that. If your manuscript is under consideration somewhere else, somebody else says, yes, I'd like uh, to look at that. Do mention that when the agent requests. If they mention the request, you see your manuscript. Well, I do have Random House looking at this just to let you know, but I haven't made any deals yet. That's the kind of thing they appreciate. It's like, oh, somebody does like it, but you haven't signed anything. It interests them. Don't lie. That should go without saying, but some people do. Well, you know, everybody wants this book. No. <laughs> well, let them take it then. That's what they'll say. <laughs> if you do have a, yes? Yep. But I don't tell other agents that because more often than not, unfortunately, they come back and say it's not quite right because of this, this, and this. So I don't mention to other agents. Do you think it's a good idea that we'll make more interested in agents? Right? Honesty is usually the best policy. And you do say, I, I do have some requests for partials and fulls. Okay. And, and don't say who. You don't mean, have to say what. Does that make them more interested or is it just a matter sure. of honesty? Sure. Sure. Because it's like, oh, good. Well, well, you hooked somebody, right? You got somebody interested. Okay, I'll take a look. They're going to form their own opinion. Because what's right for Agent X is not right for Agent Y. And that's part of the targeting. But you just say, I have had a couple of uh, requested partials and fulls. That's all. Um, if you do have a series in mind, this is a good time to mention it. You know, this, is, this is book one of, uh, I projected a three book series. But don't, for the love of all that is holy, tell them if you have a 22 book series. <laughs> I had an author come up to me at a show and goes, please read my book. Here, this is part one of 22. And I just look at him like, and I didn't even know him. And he's just giving it to me because he's just, hey, tell everybody about the world. Nobody wants to read 22 books by somebody they haven't ever heard of. Nobody. <laughs> Don't belabor the point. That should only take a sentence, though, if you just say, this is a projected series. Uh, go for three to five books, but don't, don't go any more than that because... Uh, a lot of them do two or three book deals if they're interested, and they do like series because it has more selling potential to carry over a set of worlds from one to the other, and if one sells well, they assume the rest will sell well, so they know that it's better for their marketing things. And again, a brief mention. Do resist the temptation to editorialize. Uh, don't proclaim how much the agent will love the work or how exciting it is or that your mom really liked it or it's going to be a bestseller if they just give it a chance or your kids really like it or how much the world needs this work. Just avoid commenting directly on the quality of your work, no matter what. Your, your query shows if you're a good writer rather than you telling them. This is part of the show don't tell part that people tell you about in writing classes, right? Show them that you're a good writer by giving them a good query. Don't tell them that you're a good writer. So thank the agent. What? Sorry, did nope. Okay. Thank the agent, but just don't carry on and don't be obsequious. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a, a quote from Logan Duro who's um, he's a literary author. Um, and he said that he wrote a book. Okay. Absolutely. You have had a professional who is willing to let you use their name to recommend some of your work. To say, my previous book was recommended by blah, 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 this author. Who, and don't say you may recognize, because either they will or they won't, and they'll be insulted if they don't. But yeah, if, if it's a name that they will recognize, absolutely put something. And again, brief, a line. My previous book was recommended by blank, 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 who said this. And they go, okay, somebody's looked at it, somebody likes it. But don't go into great detail about uh, also how, how and well you're available. Just put your email, phone number, whatever on there. Yes, your contact info. When you do your research and looking for an agent and you find something that you have in common that you feel like, oh, this is someone that might like my work, um, do you tell them what you have in common and what kind of parameters are they for what you should have in common? <laughs> that's a good question. And again, it's a very gray area. But you know, if you play high lie and they play high lie, that's so obscure that, but again, it, does that make them want to buy the book just because you play highlight? Is there highlight in the book? If there's not, not on the first communication. If this agent is interested in you and the style of writing, your hobbies, your shared hobbies uh, will be nice, but only after you've developed a relationship. If they're not interested in your work, they don't really care that you're a fellow coin collector, right? It's, it doesn't matter about the writing. So not unless you are further along in your, quote, relationship, your business relationship. Uh, 
don't introduce the idea of an in-person meeting. Don't say, why don't we have lunch? Nobody wants to meet strangers who want something from them. <laughs> don't say, you'll be visiting their city soon and like to drop in on their office. Uh, unless, if they're going to speak at an upcoming conference, if they are, are already being a presenter somewhere, you say, I, I, oh, I will be attending the X conference and look forward to hearing you speak. That's it. Not to running up and grabbing you in the bathroom and pushing my manuscript under the stall door. Do not do that ever. Which has happened, believe it or not. People have had manuscripts sliding under the stall door and they're like, what? How many of those you think got published? Zero. Zero. So use, use official channels at the conference. If they go to the conference and they say, feel free to contact me, as I've done here, then you have that option. But again, Professionalism in all aspects. Appropriate query length. Now, in its entirety, the query shouldn't run more than one page. Uh, somewhere around 200 to 400 words total. And you go, that's not enough time. Here's the first test. If you can't get down all that information in that number of words, you probably can't do it in the book length. It's totally different skills, but that's the test that they're looking for. Uh, if you lack confidence or if you don't have a lot of stuff, again, keep it short, keep it sweet, but just keep everything in there pertinent, only the important information. Anything that they'd skip over, leave it out. Brevity gets you in, in, in less trouble than, than going on and on. And again, remember, people are so busy, do they, if I gave them a query like this, do you think they'd even read it? No, it's like, no, 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 first of all, you're putting the synopsis in the back, you're, you're telling us too much of the story. You're not telling me what, just what I need to know. So these things do not belong in the query. Your years of effort and dedication. Excuse me, how much your family and friends and dog love your work. How many times you've been rejected or, man, I almost made it to this person or this person. They don't care. How much money you've invested in editing and, uh, uh, and editors and how much you've, you've worked with your, your groups again. And, uh, but the quotes of praise... Again, be careful on, but only if it's uh, something that really works. And uh, if they ask that person where that person goes, oh, yes, I remember that, and I would say that, right? And that person would, would say that, right? If they asked them, they'd say, what do you think about this work? Oh, yeah, I did blurb that for them. Absolutely. That's good. That's, that's a rule of thumb, though, if they go, who? <laughs> uh, a little bit of advice on email queries that uh, email does tend to get reject, read and rejected more quickly. Now, I grew up in the battle days of uh, typing it up on a typewriter and sending it in with a self-addressed stamp envelope and then waiting and never even, they wouldn't even send the self-addressed stamped envelope back. So that tells you something about it. Uh, but email queries are very easy to delete, so they will do that. Um, you may want to create separate versions, one for email and one that gets printed out if you're going to send it a uh, lettering process. So um, if, you're, if you're doing for the formatting, so write your query in Word or text edit. Uh, strip out all the formatting and then uh, save it as simple text. This makes it easy for email so you don't get funky characters, you don't get weird things with the indents and special characters and making it choke. Again, that's kind of things that if they see, they'll just delete because they're not sure. Um, use block style, use caps for anything that would normally be in italics. Again, there's, there's um, books and articles and posts which will tell you how basically to format this stuff. So let's not go into that too much right now because we've still got more stuff. But uh, find out what the formatting should look like and adhere to those principles. And if they give you instructions on the website uh, of, or blog of the agent, follow those. They'll all tell you to use uh, William Shun's manuscript format or Shun, Shun's manuscript format and always do that because that's whatever they're looking for. If they say, you know, use Times New Roman or Courier font, whatever, follow their specific guidelines. Many people have different ones, as we have found out. So some writers, when they're doing email queries, uh, do them differently than paper. But if, again, your query should fit on a standard size sheet of paper, that 200 to 400 words, um, mostly single space, but not two. Make sure it's readable. Make sure the, the font is the proper size and the way that they like to see it. <coughs> but on a screen, again, they're going to be looking at it without scrolling, so you might even want to make it shorter than that. There's different rules now, I mean, between a printed page and a, and a screen view. So again, study those books, those articles, that information on how to do it right. Uh, 
if they don't have an email address listed and you find out, but it's probable that they don't want to deal that way. Many of them still don't. I was, I was looking back in the 90s and people still didn't have websites. They didn't have email addresses. It was like they wanted it, official U.S. Postal Service form, and some still work that way. Again, find out, target who you're going to, and find out the way they like it. So, you sent that query off to four different agents, and now what? Now you sit by your, 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 your computer or your mailbox and you're waiting. Look at their standard response time for things using the same method. Do your research. And if no response time is, is listed that they don't say, wait at least a month before you even query them about a follow-up, four to six weeks. And if it's a, a printed uh, letter, uh, you could put just a brief copy of the letter I sent, blah, blah, blah. But if you still don't hear after a follow-up attempt, just assume it's a rejection. Okay, they're just not interested in even getting back to you. And yes, these people are rude, and that's what happens. You have to be polite at all times. They don't have to because they know that you're coming to them for something. They have the upper hand. If they do ask for an exclusive read, oh, she left, okay. Uh, if they ask for an exclusive read on your manuscript, that means they don't want anybody else looking at it while they're looking at it. That means they want to give it some serious consideration and they don't want to waste time looking at it and want to get it only to have it snatched out from under them. That's bad. So don't do that. So um, give them an exclusive but make it for a very brief time, two to three to four weeks tops. Uh, put them on the hook for that. If they want exclusive, they got to get serious consideration and they got to get back to you so that your work doesn't just sit there. I have heard of, of an author who, who sent a book in and it sat on someone's desk on the corner of their desk for four years. Mm. Four years. And that was a professional writer with awards, with credits, with a track record, with sales and fans. So think about what they're going to do to you. <laughs> right? So don't let that happen. Don't be found in query jail. Um, in non-exclusive situations, if you have a second request for the manuscript before you hear back from the first agent, then just let them know, again, to answer her question there. If the second agent offers you representation, now you have to go back to the first agent and say, uh, I do have an offer, dot, dot, dot. Here's a chance to respond to see if they're interested. That might pique their interest if they know, oh, people are, are getting this. Now you, you have the possibility. Here's one example query. We're going to get very brief. Yes? Okay. Never, ever. <laughs> ever phone them. Do you know why? Because they hate talking to people. They, they are up against the wall. They get hundreds and hundreds of queries. They spend all their time in meetings and trying to make business deals. And this is the side stuff because A, you're talking to the agent who probably passed it off to the junior people to read those queries so they don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, second, they don't want to talk to you. Third, it's just going to go to voicemail and now they're irritated. Who's this idiot calling me? I said specifically on my website, I don't take phone calls. Never. Seriously, unless they've said, give me a call between 11 and 12 on Tuesday. That's the only time. Absolutely. Sorry, but that's, again, that's, after talking with many of them, they're very adamant about that. Now here's an example of uh, one good query, and this is actually by somebody I know when I was doing my research. I go, this book is The Big Rewind by Libby Cudmore, who I met at a conference, and she's a terrific uh, new writer. This is her debut novel, and it's a fantastic book, and this is how she sold it. Dear Mr. McCarthy, there's no feeling quite so thrilling as getting a mixtape from a crush. In this book, No Awkward Goodbyes, which the title was changed, as we well know happens, that carefully compiled selection of songs isn't just a way to express a secret adoration, it's a clue to a murder. One paragraph. When a mixtape designed for her friend accidentally arrives in, in Jet's mailbox, she doesn't think twice. Even in this age of iTunes and Spotify, the hipster residents of this area are in a constant competition who can be the most retro. But when she finds Kit Kat dead on her floor, then suspects the tape might be more than just a quirky collection of ballads. And then she goes on a little bit about that. And then she mentions her writing credits for music magazines. Now, this is a fiction book, a novel, but it's about music. And she knows music so thoroughly that she puts it and she gets, sets the hook of, here's what it means to this, these area residents who are into this kind of thing. 
here's the kind of music scene that I'm into, which is the same field, and here's the quirky kind of thing that I've done. She goes on to that, delighted to send you a manuscript at your request. Thank you for reading, and I look forward to hearing from you. She keeps it brief, but she keeps everything in there precise. The comment from the agent was, when people ask me what high concept fiction is, I just read them the opening sentence of this query. A mixtape as a clue to a murder? It sounds fresh, and it's definitely intriguing. So the rest of the query is clear, it's concise, <coughs> and what sets it apart is that in a very short space, she's conveyed a vividly realized setting and hinted at a strong sense of humor without resorting to one-liners or out-of-context jokes. She manages to tease the breadth of the story without overwhelming us with detail. And only three characters are mentioned, and one's a murder victim, so we don't hear a lot from her. So she's keeping the focus tight. We get the setup of the murder and a quick indication of where it goes. And it's amazing how many people choose to go into other details. But She's got it, and she caught it. So again, I'll, more information, this will be in what I send you out, so you'll be able to study it a little more, go to the website and things like that. I was delighted to see this as a fine example of a great query because it was such a good book, and I knew that. And then when I see that the, it's sold on that query alone, it's like, great, that's a terrific example to use. You want to know how many, how many copies it sold? I do not, but I know that she was successful, and that's all that matters. <laughs> There are thousands of no's. It doesn't matter. That just gets you to the one that says yes. Exactly. But I, I know her, I've known her for the last few years, and she put that novel out about three or four years ago. So it was a fairly fast process. So that did sell pretty quickly, uh, considering their world. How many copies? Don't know. Look it up on Amazon. Look it up on BookScan. Look it up on Publishers Weekly. <laughs> Part of your research. I know I liked it. That's all that matters. I read it, and I'll read more. <coughs> I'm not buying it. I'm not buying the next one. So, Well, I, I will buy the book, but I'm not buying it for production. So I do not know. That is information I don't have. So here's a few do's and don'ts. Uh, do follow the tried and true formula. Your query letter is not the time to get cute. There's a very specific standard that don't deviate from. I mean, charming is good, but don't force it because, boy, it's so hard to do and so easy to go wrong. So good formatting. Uh, the greeting, again, we've gone on the personalization. You have to do your research. Keep the body of the query letter three to five paragraphs. Again, you're doing it on one page. You don't have any more room for more than that. Uh, if you don't have a specific connection with the agent, go into the action of what the book's about. The job of the first paragraph is to get him to read the next paragraph. Uh, share the title and genre. Include the word count. Paragraph two. If you have them hooked with that first paragraph, now summarize the story. Summarize. Discuss your main characters. Again, not more than two or three. What happens and what choice they must make now. Don't give away the plot. Leave the agent more by structuring the paragraph to end with a cliffhanger. What will Elizabeth do? Or something like that. Make it a little more exciting than that. She has this life or death choice with this at stake and the fate of X in the balance. She's not sure what, what she's going to do next. A little bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, the paragraph, we're adding your bio, but only again if it's relevant, and impress the agent with any uh, writing awards that are, that are worth noting. Uh, any if you attend conferences, if you're in professional organizations, professional organizations, that's what matters. Uh, they will assume that you're going to want to write and join local and, and get to that point. Don't reinvent the wheel with a query letter. Use the short paragraphs, short sentences whenever possible. Uh, make it easy for them to skim. Use a similar tone to the narrative of your book. Think about that, because if they like the tone of the query, they go, oh, that, this person, I like that. That's going to get them to want to read it. Uh, mirror the same language. Uh, if you're using humor, that's, again, such a fine line. Humor books are very different from everything else, and they're a harder sell. So you have to do a lot of research on that one. Uh, flowery or you know, romance uh, writers, they might have a different style to tell. Uh, but again, the query letter may not be the place to do that, so that's going to be a lot harder to tell. I'm giving you a lot of information to go, but that doesn't make sense because you have to focus more on that. Yep?
to the family drama about the ties that bind and also about the ties that at times need to be severed. That's the summary you right there. That. That's, that's what the summary is. Uh, but again, make it a little more personal. Mention your protagonist and the oh, conflict. I that yeah, and the, and the conflict. Yeah, don't go on too much. Mm -hmm. That should be in that first paragraph, pretty much. Yeah, I was thinking of like yeah. doing the, what you were saying, the book and everything, and then at the end of all that, saying it's a family drama about blah, blah. Study uh, the other queries and what they mention. I mean, I'm going to give you some, some query sites that tell, and they'll tell you what they like to see and what they don't like to see. And if you look at it and it looks like the ones that they're saying are good, yeah. go with it. And if they say, nah, too long, you'll be able to find out. That, that calls for, again, when you get into specifics, the question is, is a one by one basis. There's no one size fits all, as we have learned. Follow their submission guidelines. If they have published, follow to the exact letter as if your life depended on it. If they say, I do not want to see Carrier font or whatever. I want to say one and a half inch margins instead of one inch margins. Whatever they say they like, you have to jump through every one of those hoops or you're never going to get it. Yep. In um, some email um, requirements, it says five pages or ten pages. How do I define those? Should I assume that that means single space? Uh, double space. In a manuscript submission, it's always double space and it's manuscript format. If you look at William Shun's manuscript format, it will tell you the format for that. Is that yeah. Website or book that yeah, book? yeah, basically that'll be in the, in the resources that you'll get. Um, yeah, uh, how so many pages? So Three I to five the, pages? So I take the pages of manuscript and then move that into the email. Most will not want to see that in the query. Most will ask for it, then they'll say, send me the first five pages, send me the partial, send me the full. Most will not want to see that in the query, but some might. And if they do, yeah, that's, all, that's a whole other level of now I have to put this stuff in there. So again, you're going to have to find out from their guidelines exactly how they want it. Yeah, again, that's a tough question. That's a tough question, again, because you see everybody, there's all these quirky individuals that may have different requirements for that, and they're going to get cranky if you don't do it exactly, but how do you know if they don't write it down? I've been seeing some trends, and one of them is when you go to the individual literary uh, website with all the, the bios, they'll say what they want, but they'll have a form that you need to insert your information, so you're actually taking <coughs> sections of your query right. and putting it in, so yep. it was difficult to have a, like a really good query, I thought but then to hit that site and break it up and all that. So there's that challenge. The other one is I'm seeing almost all of the agents asking for a first chapter, first five pages. Like, okay. It's all, it's really Do they want it as an attachment? Usually well, that would well, be an attachment. That's another thing. Yeah. They want it either inserted on their site or they want it pasted in. Or pasted in, in as text. text. Which means with illustrations, you write out of luck, by the way. No, yeah, no. yeah. So, if you've got an illustrated book, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. So the point I wanted to make on that is that, we, you know, I spent a lot of time on the query, you know, going to sites and really, you know, trying to make it perfect, like you're yep. talking about here. And they don't and, care, those bastards. I think, <laughs> is, I think all it is is like an intro, and then those first five pages, man, those aren't, you know, that's where the focus has to yep. be. So I, will, I will include the book, the first five pages, by Noah Loopman, who tells you what the first five pages should be like, so now you know. that and That's all the chance you ever get. And it's surprising when you show those first five pages to somebody how, how maybe not good it is. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's a tip, which we're including for free. Take your manuscript, uh, get a couple of people, strangers, who don't really care about your opinion, and read it out loud to them. If they're getting bored, if they're like, oh, look, eye rolling, or if they're walking out of the room, you know it, it, it sucks. Or if they say, you know what, I'd like to hear some more of that. Now maybe you've got something. Read it out loud because you will discover after hearing the stuff, what looked good on the page sounds like crap <laughs> or sounds really good. So that's, that's a secret. And also try to put it in a different font and things. If there are mistakes in there, you'll come across them when you read it out loud. And yeah, when you send a query letter off, that's another good example. Read it out loud to, to see how it sounds. Does that sound like, like you? Or does that sound like some idiot? <laughs> right? Uh, it's going to be difficult because, yeah, <laughs> it is a new world and you used to, the world used to be one way. One way to format, one letter, one single thing, and now it's a whole new world of, of email, 
No phones ever. Uh, you know, some people don't work with letters, and you just never know. That's why I say bypass that whole part. Get a, get a really good pitch. Learn how to do a pitch. Go to a conference and sit down with an agent and pitch them. And if they say, great, send me 30 pages, send me five pages, send me a full. That's the, that's the way to skip around so much of this. You'll still need to do a query letter afterwards, but now it's a little easier because requested. So you've already passed that first hurdle. Do you go to agencies that need it? No, I, d I go to uh, specific uh, conventions within my genres because that's where the professionals are, and that's where the people who are successful and doing what they've been doing for 30 years will, be, will tell you for free of uh, what you need to know. Yeah? Do you have advice for people who don't have a lot of funds to go to these conferences and ways to go to them, or is there a book about Write that essay for the scholarship like I did, absolutely. So that got me into a place that I wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. I f went down, I found it was great, and now I'm going to raise the funds to go next year because it was so valuable to me. So yeah, um, look for those writing fellowships, those scholarships. A lot of these conferences will say, if you don't have the funds, apply for a scholarship. I know Sisters in Crime does that. I know Mystery Writers of America does that. I know that this Killer Nashville conference did it. Very many of them, romance writers, I'm sure that they have one as well. Go for that. That's, that's your best way. Absolutely. Get somebody else to fund you. Become a great speaker and become a, a guest at the conference when they invite you. Get on the panel and they'll pay your way sometimes or at least pay for your conference. Okay, we're almost out of time. We'll, we'll zip through to the end. How's that? And so save up all those questions and uh, throw in why you're pitching the book to that particular agent. Again, uh, my book's about highlight, and I saw that you were a highlight player. So yes, I thought that you'd be the perfect uh, one for this. Look at their track record. What books have they represented? What kind of books are out there? And what's the kind of thing that they like to see? Um, don't let them connect the dots. You do it for them. I saw that you did this and this. My book is similar in tone to this. I thought you might be interested. <laughs> do mention that your book has been reviewed by a professional editor, and they love a polished manuscript. Remember that error-free part? Serious about that. Errors are the things that are going to get you chucked out quicker. If you've got errors saying, oh, I'll get an editor to fix that later, no. This is your business communication. This is your store. If, if you've got a restaurant and the food comes out all wrong on different size plates and things, and you say, well, I'll fix that later, you only get that one chance. That one chance right there. And they're going to um, reject most of the people they see. Don't be that person. Don't be the rejected ones. Be the successful one. Ah, key to querying agents is volumes. So two or three queries might not make it. Again, make that master list, the A list, then make a B list if what happens when that doesn't. Do your research and get that out to as many as you can. Uh, and remember that every great writer in history, almost every single one, has been rejected by these people. Almost every one. So many books of the past would never be published today because they wouldn't, A, sell enough, it didn't have the right hook, it, it started wrong, it's like, who are you? I don't know who you are. Boom. If everybody, if the best in the world get rejected, that means nothing to you. One of the reasons I went independent is because I saw a panel of all bestsellers and everyone held up a book that had been rejected an average of 50 times each, every single one of them. And if all these bestsellers, six to eight people on a panel, have been rejected 50 times, I'm like, that means the people on the other end really don't know what they're doing. They can't tell a good manuscript if it comes up and hits them in the side of the head. They get lucky with a shotgun approach and that's all they do. They publish something and hope it gets out. And every book that's a breakout success is a complete surprise. So a few things uh, about what not, not to do. Don't go beyond a page. Uh, don't oversell. We've gone through that. Um, and don't put these sentences in. Get ready to read your next bestseller. This book belongs with the treasured classics. You'll kick yourself if you pass this one. Yeah, don't put anything like that in there, please. <laughs> Okay, and don't self-deprecate yourself. Say, well, I'm not really sure if you like this. Leave all that stuff out as well. Uh, I, I hope I'm not wasting your time. Anything like that. Just don't put that in. Just expect that they'll say yes, but don't put that into the letter, okay? This is, this is your confidence level of a writer. Develop that thick hide, that rhino hide. 
So if you're doing letters, your self-addressed stamped envelope always has to go in there. Remember that. Professional clean, no coffee stains on the manuscript, obviously. No writer's tears dripping all over the manuscript. Because there's enough of those. Uh, don't mistake your bio for a memoir. You have two sentences to turn the spotlight on, and that's it. Don't talk about your childhood in the south of France unless it's germane. Don't handwrite or use strange fonts. Please, no comic sans for any of your, uh, any of your corrections. Okay, do that. Here's a few uh, critiques of sample letters, reviewing personal choices by these people. You'd do better to focus more on plot and less on character in this query. It's difficult to reduce complex motivations and situations to enticing descriptions. Another one. This query runs 413 words. The discipline of writing within a 250 word limit forces you to focus and hone. If you look at the word count as an arbitrary hoop to jump through, you're missing the value of what it requires. That 150 word difference was what turned them off. Wow, they're getting really strict and really specific. Now do you see what you're up against? I know, it's, you've got a bunch of cranky people. So, <laughs> so you've got to do it just right. A query letter is not the place to reveal the ending of the book. You want to entice me to read it, not tell the whole story. Yet she says somewhere else, and if he can't find the culprit, what's the climax of the book? <laughs> okay, you just contradicted yourself, but uh, the lesson is not to confuse or lose the reader. You have to be clear. If they have a question, they're befuddled, you haven't done your job. Sorry, but that's the way it is, even if they're stupid. <laughs> Log lines are the worst thing publishing is imported from the film industry. And that's a contrary opinion because a lot of people do like the log lines. What's this book about? Um, hey, scientists have found a way to bring back the dinosaurs and something goes horribly wrong. Anybody know what that's from? <coughs> yes. And they go, brilliant, high concept. They love high concept because they know they're going to sell that. Everybody gets it. Everybody knows what it's going to be about and everybody wants to read it. What's that? Log line, it's called. Again, this is part of your research. Find out what a log line is. Find out what a, an elevator pitch is. Find out what your 30-second uh, elevator pitch is. And then longer if they want you to go on. The best thing to ask, somebody asked about uh, talking to them. Wait for them to say something. If you, if you sit down with an agent and you give them a three-sentence great pitch, wait. And if they say, tell me a little more, boom. Now have your next three to five sentences ready and see what happens after that. Work in steps. Professional communication doesn't happen all at once. Don't hit them with a fire hose. Give them a polite, precise, concise, professional query letter, and you're way ahead of the game. All your communications are like this, not just queries, but synopses. Again, I'll give you some resources on how to write those, those whole books on how to write the synopsis. And again, that's another hard point. But the, you might not get to the synopsis if you don't have a good query. So again, we have to take it in stages. So what other questions do we have? I know we have lots more. Okay. Should be known? I know that you to read a manuscript? Nope. No, you don't. <laughs> you covered query letters very extensively. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Would you be willing to do another talk like um, Chris Kwan made the Kwan Group and how they approach query letters? Yeah. Would you be willing to do another talk like Chris Kwan made the Sure. I mean, if, if Seven Bridge <laughs> absolutely wants to have me back, I'm, I can talk yes. all day. <laughs> I went on to a radio station to talk about writing and publishing for a, a guest spot, and they brought me on for the next 14 weeks because they were like, oh, tell us some more, tell us some more. <laughs> if people want to see that, again, give the feedback to the Seven Bridge. Tell them what you want to see. I would like to see a speaker on this and this and this. And if there's somebody better qualified than me, then absolutely get them in that they know of. Sure, her first and then back to you, Ben. When you do the research and, and um, go to a publishing house that you think um, publishes books similar to yours and they give you the, um, the agent, sometimes they have, they say they work with a junior agent or sometimes there's a more um, experienced agent and less experienced agents and you have to choose between them. Yeah. I get confused about, I know the Who newer agents, to? they're accepting more but they have less experience. Do you so shoot for the top or do you go with what, what might be, okay, here's the thing, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, the experienced people have more to do and they want to deal with uh, the more profitable people and uh, less volume and higher profit. The junior agent's going to be a lot hungrier to bring a great project. Now when an agent says, I like this, they submit to an editor. They know the people at the agency will know the same editors. 
the more senior one has a better relationship, but they'll say, great, send this on to, to, to Hank at Random House. Okay, that kind of thing. Now, when the editor gets it, the editor, who thinks it's a great book, now has to go to the sales and marketing department and the editorial board in a big meeting and say, I'm putting my job on the line by saying, we need to publish this book. Wow. Okay, so it's less the agent representing you as is what the work is in the agency. Because if it comes from the agency that a publisher has worked with, a personal relationship is great, but they're willing to at least look at it because the agent said, this is something you're going to like. And the editor, if they've got a relationship with that editor, the editor's then going to have to like it and then take it to other people who think it's going to sell. Do you see what a difficult world this is? Yeah. So um, take a chance. If you think, again, this is personal preference. If you say, you know what, I just know Agent X is going to like this because they've been in the business for 30 years and they're going to love this book. Or, you know, there's a new hungry young agent there who really wants to, to make her bones at this agency. I think I've got a good shot with that. And she's going to go and she's going to become a star because she's representing this book and she's going to probably have a better chance of reading it than anybody else at that agency. So again, it's, 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 it's a tough call. And that's, this is why I say it's all business. This is going to affect your future. Every single decision has got so much at stake. Every communication you make in the business world, is there's so much at stake. So do your homework, do your research. It's going to take me a couple of days to get all those resources together because I'm going to throw so much at you. You're going to see a resource list of different websites, of, of books, of different places to go, of uh, just methodologies of, of trying to find out things. So be patient. <laughs> I mean, we have to get through all of this. Sure. Oh, yes, so can you briefly mention yeah. the basic copyright requirements? Briefly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I can. Here's a piece of paper. If I write three sentences on that, I have written it down and it is now copyrighted. The act of creation is copyright itself. Will it hold up in court? Maybe not. It's not dated, everything like that. Evidence and documentation are great. The, the old poor man's copyright of mailing yourself, don't even worry about that. If you're worried about your creative work being copyrighted, which you, not being stolen, but just, yes, copyright your work, $35 will get you copyrighted uh, work. And again, I, okay, I'll put that down on the resource list, definitely. Uh, and you also need to read Christine Catherine uh, Rush's book on copyright because you have to understand what that means to your work, your intellectual property, and your future. If you sell to a publisher, they're basically controlling the copyright. And you know how long that is? 70 years after your death, i.e. forever. They own that. Anything else, if you go independent publishing, you're controlling your copyright. And someone asks, what about Amazon? They don't copyright. They just distribute. You own your copyright. If I wanted to take all my books off Amazon tomorrow, I could. I just go, unpublish, done. No copyright problem at all. Um, I'm writing nonfiction. Yep. What style of nonfiction? Narrative. Okay. Historical narrative. Um, and I think I represent a small number of the people here and people in general, and maybe also your experience, although you said you also did some nonfiction. So yep. if there's any a pointer, it's a whole different kind of ball game in many respects. Um, I'd be interested in that, but I'm going to ask you a very pointed question, which is this. When you self-publish, you do not necessarily get a Library of Congress registration, and because of that, in fact, you're not likely going to get one, from my understanding. And because of that, the libraries in America are not really going to come across your book. And you could lose out on huge numbers of sales because libraries are not going to pick it up. Um, I love this question. I have some great news for you. Yes. To get a book into the Library of Congress, you just need to follow their procedure. But you they, send them. They don't register everything. You send them. You from. have to register it because the publishing company does that as a matter of course because they're doing volume. You can register with the library. My books are in the Library of Congress. You send them a couple copies, you send them the right forms and, and a fee, and your books are in the Library of Congress. If your books are listed on, on Baker and Taylor, books in print, Bowkers, whatever, 
your books are listed, libraries can find it. They, they, it is accessible. It's in their catalog. ISBNs, which you can purchase that's your own what, self. Maybe that's what I'm picking up. You don't you need, necessarily get an ISBN. You don't, you don't get given an ISBN. You have to buy them because it's a scam that uh, you have to pay them a lot of money for a simple random number. Yes, but, but it can be done. I'm thinking of something else. I'll have to email you. Yep, absolutely. But um, yes, there's ways around it. Because anything that the big publishers can do, you can do. You can get your books into bookstores. I'm in bookstores in four different states. It's a matter of going to them. It's a lot more work. But I'm in uh, bookstores in four different states. Uh, my books are accessible in libraries around the, the country. I donate my e-books for free. Um, you can get in anywhere that you want if, if you're willing to go through the process that it takes to, to get through there. Yep. I couldn't get it into a library, couldn't because it was Bowkers or no, whatever. You could, so but they didn't get you in there. So, they <laughs> so I can do that on my own. I can go to Bowkers. Absolutely. Oh, I didn't know that. What's Bowkers? Yeah. Uh, Bowkers, B-O-W-K-E-R, and Books and Print. These are large uh, registration distribution organizations which formalize the, the distribution and selling of books in print. And again, there's, there's lots of different places to do this. And again, this is part of the research. It's learning this vast work. <laughs> You don't have to learn everything all at once. Trust me, that's okay. I published with Small Press too because I wasn't yet ready. And after two years, I'd learned enough to be able to do things uh, better and faster and certainly with a lot more profit to myself than they did. They went out of business. I got my rights back, which you can do. Uh, get your rights back and do it yourself because you've learned how to do everything. You've learned the process. And you can do as much or as little as you absolutely want. If you want to be in, in libraries, if you want to be in the Library of Congress, you can do that. If you want to be in bookstores, you can do that. Not all of them, like the big chains like Barnes & Noble, get, get a little sniffy at, uh, oh, if you're not published in Manhattan, we don't want to publish you. But you can get a, there's lots of independents. The Silver Unicorn Bookstore just opened up in um, Acton, Mass. Uh, there's a bookstore in Dover, New Hampshire that just uh, contacted me a few weeks ago and said, somebody came in looking for your books. We looked you up. We'd like to carry your books. What do you think? Would you like to come in for a talk? You know, as it gets out there, it, there's a way to do it. Sure, more questions. I know you got lots more. Sure. So aside from Amazon, where were you selling your books? Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, distribution companies, which I spoke to somebody about, Smashwords and Draft2Digital for eBooks, uh, Kobo, iTunes, uh, all the major bookstore chains that, that also get it from the distributors, Powell's bookstores, any online book distributors, Aid Books, uh, Brickyard Books, in uh, Maine and any number of book distributors. If you go on and you check their catalog, you'll be able to find a lot of my books, and not, maybe not all of them, because some of them aren't profitable enough for me to want to take the time and pursue to get it into their system, but enough of them are out there that they were able to find them. Yeah, all over the place. Another quick question. How valuable do you think a website is for somebody that's just trying to get something off the ground published? For your first book to try to get published, not as much. But when you have an established piece of work out there that you're interested in, that's the first place I go when I want to find out about an author. I go to their website and see what they're about. I look at the home page, which is called the splash page of the home page. I look at their list of the materials that they've done. I look at their author bio. I look at if they've got any upcoming events. And I see how current that website is. If the last entry was four years ago, they're not really interested in that. Am I interested in them if they're not going to remain current? It is tough because that's one of the many time-consuming, possibly expensive things that you need to move on. But it is a critical piece if you're a business person. If you have a business in the modern world, you do need a website. Yes? This is a very specific question, but anyway. We, uh, okay, one quick question before you go. I know that we, we're slopping over the time frame and they may need to kick us out or if anybody does need to go, I am available. Uh, make sure that email is accessible, that I can access you, and you can email me questions afterwards, but I'm also here until they kick us out. So, yes? Um, so, I do think it's probably relevant to a bunch of people. I have two sets of characters, main characters, secondary characters, but they're still main. They, they're plots intertwined. Should I just focus on the two main characters and leave out the secondary characters in my query? Absolutely. Remember? Okay. Two to three. Tops. Just want to make sure. Protagonist, antagonist, anybody, the murder victim or whatever. So. Having said that, let's take your questions to Dale at this point because we're already over time. So. Thank you, everybody. Sure, let's come back and do all the other business stuff and <laughs> synopses. And